how much can you make per hour? Okay, if you are doing what you need to be doing, if you're closing a deal, if you're working on a lead, if, how much does that equate to per hour? Okay, now how much does it cost to hire someone for that hour to do your laundry? 20 bucks? Hey, welcome back to another awesome episode of Life in a Show podcast. I'm your host, Jason Wojo. On Life in a Show, we help people make more, work less, and live awesome lives, because all three of them are important, right? I am joined by Polish Peter, my co-host, and we got an awesome guest today. What's up, dude? Hey, man. Yeah, I'm excited for this particular episode because this woman is pretty impactful. She yeah, gets things out. done and she makes things amazing things happen. So one of the things that I love about this particular episode is not only are we talking about business, but we're talking about personal life. And actually the personal life stuff, what she's doing in her life, how it's actually impacting her business and being able to be successful as an entrepreneur in her life. Yeah. We talked about that, dude. It was awesome. Some really gold nuggets in there. We also talked about, you know, if you ever have the idea of selling your business, what are some of the things you need to consider? We talked about lessons from failures. I mean, just a gold, gold nugget filled episode right here. Um, this is, this is an interview. Her name is Ariana Pereja. Let's go right now to the episode. Here we go. Hey, Ariana, what's up? Welcome to Life Fair Show. Hey guys, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on this amazing show. We well, listen, we are excited to have you. Now, despite the fact that, you know, you know Peter before this, I will not hold it against you because you've accomplished <laughs> some amazing things that I cannot wait to dive into. And so one of the things that really struck me, first of all, is, is you've, you've accomplished an extreme amount uh, at, at a relatively young age, right? And like you've been recognized for this, and which, which is amazing. And so I wanted to kind of start off with like, just, just a general question, like where is this entrepreneurial drive for you coming from and what is it that drew you to entrepreneurship to begin with? Yeah, great question. Um, so I never actually set out to be an entrepreneur. I kind of fell into it. My parents came to the United States. I was the anchor baby. Um, mother was escaping communism. My father was escaping war in Afghanistan. And when they came here, they kind of lost everything, left everything behind to come here to start a new life. So as you can imagine, uh, two immigrant people raising me. I grew up in, um, you know, low income housing. And for me, it was always like, okay, I had this enormous stress at a young age of like, I need to, I need to do something. I need to do something big to take care of my parents because they sacrificed everything to come to this country. So, um, I got into sales naturally at a young age. I'd say it was about in second grade when I came home one day with a wad of cash in my backpack. And my mom said, she pulled out the cash. She said, what is this? What, <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing here? And so what I was doing is any change that I had found around the house or whatever, I would go to the gas station and I would buy four cookies for a dollar. And they were, you know, and then I would go to school and I'd walk around the lunchroom and I'd sell them. And then I just kept doing that over and over. And my parents were like, what are you doing? So that was my first kind of um, experience with, with becoming an entrepreneur. Yes. So did they believe you that you were selling cookies? My parents? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the, 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 the yeah. No, no, they, they believed me. They were, my mom was like upset, but also proud at the same time. It was, it was kind of a, one of those like pivotal moments as a kid. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm, I'm good at this. Like I'm good at talking to people. I'm not scared. I, and so that was one of those first glimpses of, okay, I can, I could be doing really good in sales. Um, and then when I was 18 years old, I got into real estate and I got into a commission job pretty early on. Um, and that was the first time in my life that I was exposed to what it's like to manage your finances, right? Because if you're a hundred percent commission, you have to manage whatever money that comes in and make that last until your next commission check. So that was my first real opportunity to understand what it's like to manage money, right? What's what it's like to manage a business. Um, and, and from there, that's kind of just the, the route that I took. When you say commission, were you talking about as a real estate agent? So uh, at that time, no, I was getting, I had, had a job as a settlement agent. And so my company that I had worked for had 
transitioned and it was like during, you know, 2007, 2008, when everybody was getting laid off and they were like, Hey, look, we can't pay you a salary anymore. You're a hundred percent commission now. And so I transferred into a hundred percent commission while also studying to get my real estate license. But yeah, that was, that was the very first time I had a commission job. Mm. So talk, you know, I'm curious about that. Like what are your thoughts on like commission only positions? Like, did you like it? Do you feel like it pushed you to perform? Or do you think that like, that's a, like, that's a bad approach. Cause I, you know, I've wondered about this for myself. Like when, you know, when we hire, uh, hire sales reps, for instance, like, should we pay them a base plus commission or is commission only like the better way to go? Like, how do you, how do you get them? How do you get people performing the most and help them succeed in, in the highest degree possible? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So you have to remember at that period of time, there was no such thing as a base anymore. Everybody was going commission. Everyone was going out of business. I mean, I saw companies close down left and right companies that had, you know, 500, 600 loan officers that were just shutting down overnight. So to me, when, when my boss at the time said, listen, you you still have a job. It's just hundred percent commission. I didn't have any choice, but to say yes. Mm. So that, that's an interesting question. If it was a good economy and he, approached me with that idea, maybe I might've had a different, you know, attitude towards it. Right. Right. Maybe I would have said, okay, let me just go work for another title company that pays me a big base and all these bonuses. I don't know. I didn't really have a choice, right. The industry had changed so much that there was no point of even trying to look for a job because everybody was out of a job. Right. Right. Well, I'm wondering, like, you know, you've developed a skill set. we'll get into that in a second, but like, I'm wondering if this is kind of a blessing for you in a weird way where like you were forced to sink or swim, you're thrown in the deep end and you're like, I, I got to make this happen. There's no, there is no safety net. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was definitely another pivotal moment in my life because then I realized, Oh, I'm capable, right? I don't have to rely on anybody else. It gave me this self-confidence that I didn't know I had inside right? I was used to having a pretty good base salary with all my, my base and my bonuses commissions. I was coming out to like 80 K per year. And then all of a sudden now I'm switching to a hundred percent commission. And now I I'm a hundred percent reliant on, on replacing that income. And I actually outperformed what I was doing on salary and got to six figures. So that's when it was like a huge jump for me mentally of like, Oh, I can do this. I am completely capable of being an entrepreneur and starting an actual business and managing um, leads and money and P and L and the whole nine. So, so, so talk to me through that because you, so you started, so you tell me about your first business, like that first venture you have, you have three big businesses that you sold, made an exit from. And I totally want to, like, I'm so I'm fascinated with this topic by the way. And so I want to know how you did it, but what was that first business? Yeah. So the first business was, so as I just mentioned, I was think or swim, trying to figure it out. 2008 comes around and I always had a, a passion for uh, event planning. And I figured, okay, everybody I know is like getting out of the business. I had done all right for 2007, 2006 and 2007 on commission. And then I thought, and I was still young at the time. I was only like, what, 20, three, 22 years, no, 21 years old. I was 21 years old at the time. And I'm like, I had to, let me just see what else is out there. Cause I kind of fell into real estate. Let me just see. So I went back to school, went to GW, um, for event management and then quickly got recruited to, uh, there was a company that dealt directly with, uh, government contracts to do event management. So I said, okay, let me try this out and see what, what happens. And also the industry had taken a huge tank. So, did that, um, did that internship for about six months, made really great relationships. From there, I left and decided to start my own event management business. And what we did is we specialized in DOD, uh, Office of Small Business Programs. They have a mentor protege conference. And so that was one of the first contracts that I worked on. Um, I grew that team to five internal staff with 35 contractors. I did the day-to-day of that for about four years. Meanwhile, uh, still involved with real estate on the side as, as things started to pick up and get back to normal. Um, year four, my number two employee who, uh, was really like my right hand person when I wasn't there said, I want to go out onto my own and I want to do my own thing. And I said, okay, well, instead of going out on your own, 
why don't you just buy my existing book of business and all the inventory that I've purchased, all the tables, the linens, the chairs, all this stuff, lighting, decor. And you could pay me 250 K and you could do it over a course of three years. So then that way you don't have to come up with the money right up front. And she said, okay. And so that's what we did. And then from there, I went on to run the real estate team with my husband that he had originally started. And then I grew it. And then we sold that uh, to Compass in 2017. So when I walked in, he had about you know five active agents, one transaction coordinator, and then I basically doubled the team, doubled the revenue. Well, 60% actually for being technical, brought in 60% more revenue and then put it to uh, sell to Compass. So they, they acquired us in November of 2017. Meanwhile, the same time all this is going on, um, 2015, November of 2015, we find out that Zillow is having a hackathon. Um, and for those that want to win an open API to all the public record data in the United States. So my husband and I said, this is pretty interesting. And we were actually trying to solve a problem for our own selves of, of running the real estate team of how to better service our multi-transactional clients and our investor clients. And so we called CoreLogic and Black Knight, the two largest data providers in the country. And we said, how much would it cost to get the data on these six counties that we're servicing? And they said this number that would make you want to throw up. And we're like, okay, there's got to be another way. So we went to this, this little hackathon, which was put on by Wrestley, um, competed against 200 teams, didn't sleep all night, and we actually won. And so when we won, we had an open API to all the public record data in the United States, built out a MVP when we came back from that event. And we st- uh, took it to KW and Realogy at the time. And they said, we want to buy it. And we're like sitting down. I'll never forget this moment. We're sitting down and we're like, okay, what if instead of just selling it to one brand, we level out the playing field, find an actual distribution channel and sell it to everybody, regardless of what brand they're affiliated with. And that distribution channel was the MLSs. And so we immediately were like, okay, this is going to be a huge, huge opportunity. So that's when I had the con, this is November, 2015. That's when I had the conversation with my number two person said, just buy me out. And then I told my husband, you need to focus on Remind. I'm going to go run the team. We're going to build this out. We're going to sell that. We're going to also use the proceeds of that to put into Remind. So the first 18 months of Remind, while I was managing the team, that was the funds that we needed to cover all of our co-founders salaries and all of like our head engineer, right? Because we're talking, we had, a, there was a total of five of us co-founders and all of us kind of walked away from our real estate businesses for Remind. And the first 18 months, we didn't have any cash. We didn't, you know, we were using the money from the real estate team to cover everybody's lifestyle expense. So we were using that money to, to for that startup, because as, as anyone who's listening knows, especially with SaaS startups, it's a long time until you become profitable and you can go out and you can raise capital um, at the beginning to try and cover your lifestyle expenses. But the reality is most VCs and most you know, institutional investors and sophisticated angel investors, they want to deal with a company that has already raised their first couple million for themselves. They have skin in the game that they, they have product market fit. So being able to cover all of our lifestyles, those first pivotal 18 months, we needed to run that real estate team. So that's where I stepped in. I walked away from the event planning business to run the real estate business so that we could have that income. Wow. I don't know what to say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so listen, I mean, it's a pretty impressive uh, thing that you've been doing over the past decade. And one of the things that I'm hearing as you're sharing this with us is you're pretty driven, right? Um, there is a lot of hard choices that you've had to make, right? As being entrepreneur and then on your own and raising those, you know, comp- companies and then selling them and things like that. And I'm wondering, sitting here as an entrepreneur who was probably listening to this particular podcast and is thinking, well, you know, that's Mar- Ariana. I guess she can do that. You know, she looks pretty, you know, like she's awesome. But what about me? 
Um, so I'm curious for you to share with the audience, like, what are some of the lessons that you learned from this entire journey that has helped you get to where you're at? Because, you know, making tough choices, right? Decisions, uh, family, you got a husband involved that you're working with a husband. And a lot of times couples don't work very well, right? Um, you have all those different things that are probably along the way, obstacles and things like that. So what have you learned out of all of this? Oh man, so many lessons to share, but I would start with mindset. So that's always been a very, very important part of my life. Every single quarter, um, since I was 18 years old, I always go to either a mastermind retreat or I've had a coach or I've had mentors. Mentors are extremely important. I've had a mentor from every single aspect of my life. I've had, you know, I, I since I turned 18, I could have my own money. I've had a personal trainer. I've had a business coach with my first business. I've had, um, you know, always been part of some sort of mastermind group because you need that accountability, especially when you're an entrepreneur, because when you're an entrepreneur, it can get very lonely. And the reason why it gets lonely at the top is because you have no one to vent to. And if you are in business with your spouse, it's really toxic to vent to your spouse. It can really affect the day-to-day -day relationship between the two of you. And venting to your co-founders also is not productive because then you get off track. And depending on who your investor is, venting to your investor is also not a great idea, right? Or employees, and, right? <laughs> or yes, yeah, you definitely can't vent to your employees, right? You have to walk in every single day and, and have a, you know, the attitude of we've got this. So... Having that consistent mindset accountability is what would say, I would say would, would, is what really helped a lot. Self-development. I'm huge on self-development. I've done Landmark. I've done Tony Robbins and Lisa Power Within, Business Mastery. I mean, you name it, I've done it. I'm constantly reading new things. Um, I don't watch TV. I probably haven't watched TV consistently since like high school. Um, I just, I just don't, I don't watch TV to me, every single moment in your day needs to be maximized. If I'm going to spend 30 minutes watching a TV show, that's 30 minutes. That's taken away from me being able to cook a healthy meal from spending time with my kids to exercising, to reading a book that's going to make me better. So really maximizing your calendar is what I would say is another thing that's extremely important as an entrepreneur, as a wife, as a mother, um, really maximizing and, and being protective of your time. So is that how you, because what I'm hearing is you have some kind of a vision that you want to live, right? You have some kind of a view of how you want your life to be and being a mother and a wife and, you know, business owner and entrepreneur, there's so many of those different aspects that play into it, right? So how you balance all that out is just being, yeah. How yeah you balance that's great. Great question. So I would start with delegation. I'm a huge proponent of delegation. I'd rather delegate and yes, it may not, whatever that task may be, might not be hundred percent perfect, but if I could get 80% of my time back because I delegated that task and maybe it's not hundred percent, that task is completed to let's say 75% mm -hmm. with some errors and mistakes, it's still better than me taking on everything myself. And I managed my home. Like I managed my business. So I had a role for everything. If I was to onboard a, let's say an au pair or a nanny or a housekeeper, I had a, a guidebook so that when, cause you know, if you've ever hired a housekeeper, sometimes they come, sometimes they go, they, they do every other things and you have to hire somebody else. I took the time out of my day on a Saturday to label every single drawer in my house. So if you, if you open up a drawer in my bedroom, there's a label that says socks. There's a label that says tank tops. There's a label that says t-shirts so that oh. if, and when a new housekeeper comes in, she knows exactly where to put the laundry away. Cause I'm not going to waste my time doing laundry. That's a terrible use of my time. I know my value. I know what I can get and, and doing laundry, going to the grocery store is not a dollar productive activity for me. Do I like to cook? Yes. It brings me joy. So I actually do cook a lot of times at home because I enjoy it. It's for me, it's a pleasure, but those certain tasks, like what I just mentioned, laundry, going to the grocery store, that's, that's not a good, I, that's not a good use of my time and I'm not going to do it. And I haven't done it for over a decade. And I think that's, 
why I've been able to have a family and been able to start and exit three businesses and then to take on a, all these new portfolio companies that I now manage and my family foundation because I delegate and because I have a system and a process for every single thing in my life. For every single you have a pro- Do you have a process for a husband too? Because I'm a husband too. So I'm like wondering if there's a labeling system for him as well. So how- well, I mean, actually, yeah. a little bit. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. Let's be honest, right? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we, we have it in our calendar. Like most people, they get together with their spouse on new year's Eve or new year's day. And they, they plan out their resolutions. I typically like to do it in either Q2 or Q3 the year prior. Why? Because if you're going to plan a vacation or a mastermind, you need to book those tickets ahead of time. You need to book the, the, the air travel. You need to put that on your calendar ahead of time. So for example, just last night, I booked the Airbnb that my husband and I will be in, in next summer. Cause every year we leave for the summer cause Miami is extremely hot and we decide to, you know, just get out of the heat. I booked the, I booked it way ahead. Like the summer's not even over yet, but I bo- I'm booking it now so that we have it on the calendar. We don't have to worry about it later and it's just done. And then that way I can plan whatever other travel I have for that month or prior to around that. So, um, I, th- I think it's all about just, again, maximizing my, your time and calendar. If I didn't take those steps now, I wouldn't be able to maximize my calendar a year from now. So based on what you just said, because most of the things that you're saying is the personal life stuff, right? Uh, do you think that has a direct impact on your success in business? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Also. I think it does because I'm managing my career. First of all, when you're an entrepreneur, and you guys know this more than anything, your personal life is going to pour over to your business and vice versa, right? You are, this is not a nine to five. You don't get to just check out at five o'clock and live a separate life. It's your whole identity. And you know that. So being extremely organized with your personal life is going to pour into and disciplined is going to pour into your, your business life. So Ariana, how do you, so there's people out there that like, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll pay money to hire a staff member or a team member or a VA, but they feel weird when they start spending money on themselves to have a house cleaner, some, a housekeeper, you know, uh, someone do their lawn. And they, they look at this as, as some, for some reason in a different lens, what would your, uh, what would your, what would your suggestion be to those people who are having a hard time kind of outsourcing some of those things? Perfect. This is how I would do it. There's a quick and easy formula for this. How much can you make per hour? Okay. If you are doing what you need to be doing, if you're closing a deal, if you're working on a lead, if, how much does that equate to per hour? Okay. Now, how much does it cost to hire someone for that hour to do your laundry? 20 bucks. I mean, yeah, that's the difference, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yep. that's the way I look at it. Yeah. But I think what happens a lot of people when they're looking from that perspective is that um, that hour, they don't actually do the, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. Right. And that's why I think they're not looking to hire somebody because in what you were saying, right. That hour, if I'm hiring the housekeeper to do this in that particular hour, what are you doing? You're probably looking yeah, at Facebook. the, you're doing work stuff, right. That's pertaining to you. So I think that makes yeah. sense. Well, that, could, that plays into what you said before about like discipline. Right. And like, you know, yeah. so if you're, if you're going to, and I, and I love what you said about maximizing your calendar, like every minute, you know, and it's not from, a, and I, I don't want to give people the wrong impression that it's like this, like, you know, cause I, and I don't want to misspeak here or, or, and, and speak up certainly if you disagree with me, but it's not about necessarily like, Hey, I have to do this this time, but it's more about like, you get more return for your time. Like it's a good thing. It's not some weird like kind of rigid thing where it's like, I got to go, 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 go. It's, it's more of like, Hey, I get to do this because I've made these choices and I learn because I love learning and I love seeing the effects. I feel better when I'm in shape. So I enjoy the opportunity to go to the gym. I um, have a peace of mind when I cook. And so I get to cook. It's a, I think it's about creating controlling your calendar to me feels about getting to create the best of everything and, and, and balance it all. And I don't, I don't even know if I like the word balance, but like do it all at the same time. Does that, does that make sense? Or do you, do you agree? Disagree? Yeah, no, I actually completely agree with that, Jason. I think what you're, what you're conveying is that 
you get to reward yourself, right? If you have a discipline and I do this with myself often too, like, okay, we all are addicted to our phones. I am the first to admit that I scroll way too much on on Instagram. So sometimes I'll tell my, if I'm like trying to get through a task, I'll say, okay, I'm going to put my phone in the other room. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to touch it until 6 PM. And that'll be my reward. I'm going to do everything that's on my to-do list today. And when that's done, at 6 p.m., I'm going to go into the other room and pick up my phone. And I'm going to be able to scroll and look at memes and laugh myself to sleep. Right. So, but <laughs> the, it, it's the reward, right? It's, it's it, your look. You have to reward those little rewards for your discipline. Is it's like the equivalent of saying, okay, I'm going to eat healthy Monday through Friday, clean eating, go to the gym. But on Friday night, I'm going to go have a nice steak dinner and have a glass of wine. I'm going to have my cheat meal. It's the same. It's the same concept. Right. Well, and I love that because it's, I don't want people to get the impression that it has to be because they're gonna, some people might think like, oh, that sounds like that sounds terrible. And it sounds like I'm a robot and I can't enjoy life. No, I, I think it allows you to enjoy life more. I think it's better that way. Um, and so so you talk to me about. So, and by the way, I've never quite heard somebody mention like the organization part of this in their personal life and how that's helped you. Um, can you are there any other examples that you can share that our audience could take away? I love like, by the way, like I. I, I never thought as well. So we, we, we have a, someone come to our house and clean it. I've never thought of like putting together, like now they've been with us for a while and I, and, but someday they might leave. And now I got to, I never thought of like putting together like a, then you have to retrain SOP. them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. what, any, any other golden nuggets you got in that regard? Like you've played places you found like that have really benefited from organization or kind of like some sort of structure. Well, he's basically saying how he can train himself. How can we train Vojo? Yeah. That's what you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like having an owner's manual to a car, right? I, yeah. I have that. I had that role for if we were to hire a babysitter. I had that role for if we were to hire a housekeeper. Uh, I had that role for if we were to hire a, an ISA or a buyer's agent or whatever the case may be. I always had that like kind of welcome, welcome to the Pareja family. These are your roles and responsibility. This is what's expected of you. Um, and then I made it fun too. Like I would put in the welcome letter, you're allowed to spend up to $500 per year on any culinary class that you want. And I'll reimburse you. Why? Because sometimes when I'm busy, you're cooking food for my kids and for me, and I want that food to taste good. Right. And so, yeah, just things like that to make it fun and interesting. But I mean, what's 500 bucks for the whole year, nothing. And you get your, this person to have another skill. Um, and then they're more excited to work for you and they appreciate it too. Cause then they have guidance as to like, okay, how does this family like things done? And am I doing a good job? They, they'll have something to go off of. Everybody likes KPIs, whether it's a small role or the VP or the COO, people need KPIs and it makes them feel better and more valued as an employee. So run your home, like your business. If you were to hire someone at your office, would you have a a monthly sit down with them or a quarterly sit down with them? It's surprising how many people have nannies and this and that or tutors, and they don't have that once in a while touch point and sit down. It's like, hey, how are things are going? How can we improve? How can how can we do things better? Because it. it takes ten minutes out of your day, yeah, and it makes such a difference of quality between you and the relationship of that domestic staff. That makes so much sense. I love that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious now, um, those, because what I'm hearing is like, my God, I got, I got owner's manual for every single area of my life and my employees and my babysitters and my loan guy. And, and also, hi. <laughs> so my question to you is like, do you do that? Or you have somebody kind of starting off on, or like, obviously for a company, it might be a little bit different how you put those documents together, but do you have a process for that to make it more efficient? <laughs> Yeah. So like, for example, I, I had a lady that used to work with me when I lived in DC and before I moved to Miami, I asked her, I said, Hey, I know this is outside of your job scope, but I'll pay you for a couple extra hours of this. Can you put together a recipe book so that when we hire someone in Miami, they'll know what our like go-to recipes that we like to have on rotation. So she put that together. Um, other than that, like the first one, I like my first house handbook, I created, I did it on my own. Like all the brands that I like, um, I would like just take a screenshot of it and put it into a word document and say, these are the brands I like when you go to the store to restock up food for the house, you know, this is the type I like lactate free milk. I like this. I like, and yeah, it's, it took me a Saturday to do it, but it's a document that I've used for the last like 10 years. And I don't, you know, 
it's right. so, so easy. It's, it, it, it's a time saver in the long run. Oh, I love that. Than having to, yeah, retrain someone every time you hire someone. So there, by the way, there has to be a Polish recipe somewhere in the recipe book. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there of course. Yeah. <laughs> there is, of course. All right. Well, hey, listen. So, so talk to me about. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about treating your personal life like business. Tell me a little bit about, and, and you know, this. Your and by the way, your last. I don't know if you are you allowed to disclose what your what you sold your last business for. No, it got bought by a conglomerate of four of our customers, so we, we yeah. can't disclose that. But yeah, yeah. but you got it. You had a significant valuation. Um, and so it was you, one of those deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of money. So I'm curious, you've done this three times now. What are some of the things like say, because listen, a lot of people start a business and they uh they maybe maybe they operate it, maybe that's a you know mom and pop kind of shop and they want to pass it on to the kids or they want to sell it. They don't want it to die when they move on or when they maybe become too old to work and they want it to have some kind of value. What are just like a few of the high level things they need to start thinking about if they are in fact ever going to create an exit? Yeah. So I would say first and foremost, uh, multi-transactional clients, meaning that you have a good percentage of your book of business is not just, Oh, I'm doing ad spend and I got a lead sales funnel list. It's like, no, you have a, a solid JV with XYZ company. And then you have three or four of those, right? Because that's so much easier to underwrite when you're trying to sell a company and someone's deciding whether or not they want to buy it. If they can see, okay, based on these, the last three years of your financial performa, I can see that as long as we have these three contracts, we can at least at the minimum do X amount per year revenue, then that is like an easy way to underwrite the deal. One, two. So, so number one, make sure you have multi-transactional clients, JVs, right? And then the second thing I would say is most oftentimes, especially if you're a mom and pop, your the buyer of your business is most likely going to be a competitor or, and or uh, a current employee that wants to go out on their own. So be friendly with your competitors. I know that can be hard as a, as a SMB, right? But uh, that's most likely who's going to acquire you is a competitor that that's that you've been going head to head with the last couple of years. And maybe now they just really want to expand. And, um, yeah. So that when it comes to SMBs, right. When it, when we're talking SaaS and, you know, tech, that's different. Sometimes you'll get acquired just out of politics. Sometimes you'll just get acquired uh, just because they want your tech stack. Um, or sometimes they just want the founder themselves because they figure, okay, this, this founder is super smart and they can get things done. They know things in the industry and I just want to acquire their business just to have them. Right. So those, and it depends on, on, on what type of business you're in. It'll differ. But for starters, I would say, um, the multi-transactional clients and JVs. Big deals. Right. What about, um, should you know, it's also say like, so your, your first business, you sold kind of an owner financing. Um, what are some of the things like, you know, cause I, when I hear owner financing, the first part thought, like if I, if I'm considering selling a business, I'm like, well, man, what if they, what if they tank this thing, um, over this time period, how do you, how do you avoid that? How do you make sure you, you, person... you, you can't avoid that. There's nothing okay. you can do to avoid that. That's just the risk you're going to have to take. But typically once you're to that point and, and most S and B's, most mom and pop shops, they're not going to have huge multiples. Um, most people that are selling, they're going to be in a situation that either they, a are burnt out and they want to retire or B they just want to focus on their next venture and they just want some cash back. Right. So the reality of it is you're going to, um, you're going to have to just trust. I mean, you could enforce the contract, but with, I'd say like in real estate, for example, how you can make it easier. Um, what with our real estate business, what we did is we gave the person that acquired it, um, three years and we just took X amount for every closing that they had moving forward. So that was like some safety net, but the reality is there is no safety net. You All you have one. is a contract and, and you could try to, to sue them, but like, what are you going to do? Sue someone that couldn't even pay off the 250 K like they right. clearly don't have the money. 
Well, you can get yourself four guys that will can make you an offer you can't refuse, you know what I mean? I mean, that's another way of doing it, I guess. No, but I think, you know, one thing that we didn't mention, but I imagine that's probably important too, is who you're selling to is important. I mean, you got, and you know, it's not just, just because this person has money, it doesn't mean that you have to sell to them, right? So if you're especially in the owner finance, you probably want to vet that company or that person themselves that who you are selling to because you're kind of selling your baby to them that they will actually be the the likelihood of them succeeding and not dropping the ball is going to be higher yeah. because of the type of company or culture yeah. or the type of person that's would you agree with that i 100 percent agree with that and then also i would add to that that if and when you get to that point where um, they're taking over the business and obviously you deeply care about your clients because you've been servicing them for the last decade or what, what not, you know, negotiate a board seat and say, Hey, I still want to be able to mentor you. Right. And so that was, that's another thing is like, you could take that approach of like, Hey, you owe me this X amount over the course of five years. But during those five years, I, I intend on having a quarterly discussion with you to see how things are going to, to basically keep you on track to make sure you don't ruin my name of all my relationships that I've had built over the last 10 years. If you have the time and, and you know, the want to do that. Yeah. It's like a little bit of insurance policy there. Yeah. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. You know, cause I just, I see too many people closing their doors completely, like just because they didn't, they didn't really think about these things in advance. And then it, then it becomes like they're, they're too tired to even think about it. And, and now they just end up closing the doors without, without getting anything for it. Yeah, unfortunately. And, and you have to ask yourself too, if you're an entrepreneur and you're at that stage or you're trying to figure out if and why you should sell, you need to ask yourself this question. Are you selling because you're burnt out? Because if you're burnt out, just take a vacation. Mm. Like seriously, like, is it really worth, <laughs> you know, what I mean? There's, it, it happens often where people are just like, you know what? I'm burnt out. I'm going to sell it. But maybe you just need to take a vacation. Maybe you just need to hire someone that can manage it for a couple months. And you go on, on a six month sabbatical, figure out what you really want out of life, come back and then reassess. Right. It might be expensive to do that, but it might be more expensive to sell the company for pennies on the dollar or to let it crash and burn just because you were burnt out. Yeah, that's a great point. Like, so maybe, maybe make sure, you know, if you're burnt out, maybe it's a sign that you've kind of created an, an, uh, less than ideal business structure that requires you to do more than you should perhaps as well. So like there's opportunities to kind of look at operation, uh, operations and, and where, where's kind of some of these constraints and bottlenecks that, that are making you stressed out and burnt out. Yeah. And typically if you're at a point where you can, even if you're burnt out, but you want to sell your company and you have a well-oiled machine and you have staff in place and you have contracts, there's somebody on your team. There's got to be at least one person, even if it's the receptionist that you could say, Hey, I'll give you some equity. I want you to run. And, and while I, um, I take the six month break, I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? Your sales might decline, but at least the company's not hundred percent under, whereas you just throw in the towel and give up and say, I'm burnt out. Got it. You could Got come it. back refreshed from that six months and have new ideas and want to rebuild. You never know. I love that. So I love what you're, go ahead. I was gonna say, well, this is, this is amazing, but I want, you know, I, I do want to touch on one thing before we wrap it. Cause I know we're getting uh, tight on time. You've made a significant amount of money. How is life different for you now? Like how, what, what is this? How has this changed your life? How has this changed you as a person? Oh, a lot has changed. I'd say, um, the initial feeling was crisis identity. Um, because you go from being this extremely busy person that has multiple businesses, that has 200 employees, blah, 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 to now all of a sudden it's just you. And that's, that was a little bit of a crisis shift. Um, but I would say that Nowadays, I look at opportunities more based off of impact and who I actually want to work with. So I had, it's a luxury that I know it's a privilege that I have earned because in the past, when you're building a business, you take on whatever customers you can, you work with people, however you can in, in whatever capacity. Now I have the freedom and flexibility of saying, eh, I don't really like that guy. I'm not going to do business with him or I'm not going to invest in him or her. And I think that freedom is really empowering because now I only look at projects that excite me, that have impact, that is just 
yeah, things that I would normally make a monetary decision on. Now I'm like, I don't care how much money is there. I'm doing it because I like this person. So that's, that's a, a privilege that I have earned. That's awesome. Well, so yeah, I guess I have to learn from that lesson because I'm still working with Vojo here. I so say, Peter, I mean, you better hope it's going to happen, buddy. <laughs> well, that's a, thank you for bringing that up, uh, Ariana. <laughs> Listen, one last question I have for you is this, um, because in order to be successful, I bet you um, that you've gone through some failures in life. You probably crashed number a few times, right? Yeah. What's one of the biggest lessons you learn out of your failures? Oh, I have so many to choose from. Let's see. One of my biggest failures is not living. Okay. So I'd say ignorant bliss would probably be one of my repeating failures. Now, ignorant bliss. What I mean by that is as founders, sometimes we will live in ignorant bliss. Like, you know, when it's time to do that round of layoffs, you know, when that business partner has red flags, you know, when that relationship is no longer conducive to your lifestyle, um, you know these things, but you choose to ignore them because you want to live in ignorant bliss. So I would say that was my biggest failure that I am still working on till this day. I may or may not feel uh, called out on this right now. I don't know what that means, but okay, sounds like <laughs> I've, I'm got something going on in there. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Ignorant bliss. I love that. So listen, Ariana, I am so grateful for you coming on this particular episode and this podcast for sharing your wisdom with us and with the audience. Um, if, if anybody wants to reach out to you or learn more from you or whatever, is there anything you want to share where they go and how they find out about you? Sure. Yeah. They could find me um, on Instagram or LinkedIn at Ariana Preha.com. That's just my first and last name, Ariana Preha. Okay. Thanks for being awesome. on the show so much. Yeah. Man, she's a rock star, dude. Yeah, I know. I mean, where are we at? <laughs> I know, man. Yeah. <laughs> like three, yeah. I mean, multi-million dollar like sales and all this other kind of stuff. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, you know, the thing, one of the things I like the most about this episode, man, is I as like the personal stuff, how she, you know, she said she runs her her personal life like a business. But I also wanted to jump in on that because it's not, it's not like something super strict and rigid and like it's like when mm -hmm. we do our calendar, for instance, the get life getaway, right? Yeah it's not a rigid calendar you have to follow. What you're trying to do is put all the things you want to do in there first. And then we see what's left for work. And when she's talking about, you know, she runs things to get the most out of it. Like it's the things she wants to do that help her grow, that she enjoys, that she finds beneficial and finds fulfilling or meaningful. It's not like, you know, she has to optimize for every like little thing. And like, it's some rigid thing. Cause that, that wouldn't be fun, but she really, I love how she does that because it's, it is such a big part and, and it's an underestimated part of being successful in life and business really. Yeah. And the one I was hearing from her that she was sharing all the stuff is that she is a manager. Like, I mean, think about it. It's not about her doing that thing itself. It's just about managing the people, the resources, the money and all that kind of stuff. Right. So in, like, for instance, when she talked about when I asked her, like all these different, you know, uh, owner's manuals that she br brought up. Right. Um, how she do it? Well, she had the person who was cooking for her created from the beginning. So that's how she started doing it, at, you know, at the beginning. Dude, by the way, I am going to forward this episode to your wife to encourage her to make a manual for you. Manual for me? Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, well, I'll do the same for your wife. How about that? We'll both be uh, hey, what, in what are friends pickle. for? All right. What, that's so right. What are friends for? Yeah. Right. Dude, the other thing, I, I mean, um, I love what she said as well about like, you know, and this is just general business, you know, acumen and, and wise to have, she mentioned multiple uh, having multiple joint ventures and multiple transactions, you know, uh, ongoing transactions, which is really valuable for business, for, for steady cash flow, for business valuation. Uh, that was great. Um, you know, and we talked about these three businesses she sold, but I, I'm glad you, you kind of brought this out at the end. Like it hasn't been all roses and rainbows, right? Like she has had failures, um, that we didn't even talk about. And so I'm glad you brought this up, man. And regarding this whole like blissful ignorance thing, dude, this is man, that, oof. That one's so true. Like, has this happened? I mean, I know this has happened to you too, right? Like, yeah. you know, like I oh, really, that person's really not the right fit, but I don't feel like finding somebody else right now. Or man, like, I'm just not sure about this, but you do it anyway. You know what I mean? Like that, that little nudge we talk about a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that is such an important thing because I think we have something deep down inside of us. There is like this guiding system that we need to listen to it more often, you know, and we have to be more present to that. Um, the other thing that, you know, she mentioned, like, you know, when it comes to success, and I think we should be talking about this a lot more, should be talked a lot more about this is the failures. Yeah. Because I don't care who you are. When you are successful, you are failing. And I think a lot of times entrepreneurs, when they're starting to look to become more successful, they want to grow their business, whatever, they try to avoid that failure. And it's unavoidable. You just got to embrace it. You got to go with it. You got to fail. Like, you know, the faster I fail, the faster I may become successful, right? So taking the next step and going for it, you know, and, and learning from that and going the next one and the next one, the next one. And ultimately, you're going to end up somewhere up that ladder. You know what I mean? But because dude, I it is, it, you know. As you're talking, um, what I'm imagining is an EKG. Like, you know, you got your heart rate where you like the little blip that goes up mm -hmm. and it goes down and there's a big spike up then there's another big dip down. That is the heartbeat of life. That's a heartbeat of business. It's a heartbeat of everything. There's ups and downs and you just got to keep going. Like, uh, could you imagine your heart being like, well, I don't, I don't want to take this little dip. You know, <laughs> it's, that doesn't happen. It doesn't work. And so right. it's just a natural rhythm of, of success. Like it's going to always be that way. All right. Exactly, man. Yeah, that's a great episode, man. I think she did great. She was a pretty impactful woman, man. Yeah, yeah, so. she's awesome. Well, listen, we hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love if you would leave us a review. Um, give us give us a star rating. Tell us what you like about the episode and how we can serve you more. The more that you um, participate in us sharing this, the more people we can impact and we can, we can change the lives of entrepreneurs and business owners everywhere. All right, hope you enjoyed the episode. We will see you again next week. Take care, everyone.